before you sit down, turn to one another and tell somebody, look at them and say, I don't you know I love you. Now. We, we say a mouthful when we say that a lot of times because we don't understand what all that means, but I'm going to show you this morning what that actually means. It's a tough subject sometimes for us, but we can, we can do that. Let me say a couple of things before I start. Uh, let's continue to remember the family. Uh, Anthony Chavez, as he lost his life last Sunday night, I think is when it was, and, and Shane said something all ago. We, you know, we questioned God, why do these things happen? We have to remember something. Life happens. There's accidents that happen. And God doesn't cause hurt. The word said the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. Right. But we question God and say, God, why, why do these things happen? Why could you not have stopped it? And, but we don't understand all that. We don't know why. But uh, God just doesn't come down and, and do stuff like that and then cause people heartache and headache. That's, he said every good and perfect gift comes from God above. But we question God. God, why? We, we do that a lot of times. And there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong with questioning God. I think sometimes we can question God and ask him why we need to do some things or why he does some things, and I think he can reveal that to us. So I don't think it's a bad thing when we question God and ask him why things happen. We may not always know the answer, but I believe I know he loves us, and that's the main thing we've got to remember. Number two is on the pledges, some, there's been several people asking me about the pledges, how do we do this? Uh, pledges are just put as building fund and just put on there as building fund. Now, if you're giving online, you'll have to get online and get with uh, Gina Garrett or Jamie one and try to figure that out. But pledges, we can, they, they can start. I mean, we should have already started some. I think there's some coming in now. But uh, if you haven't pledged and you want to pledge, get with me and, and we'll work on that for you. But we are trying to give uh, pledges that we have so we can give to the building out here. And we're working on trying to get that thing on a four-year plan completely paid off. Now, we're trying to get the building up pretty quick. We're going to try to get it finished pretty quick. And so the guys are coming this week, I think, to start building on it. So. The building, I imagine by next Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, if it don't rain us out, you'll, have, you'll see some progress by next Sunday. We've already got the slab and everything there, so they're fixing to put the building up. So that's just kind of giving you a heads up. Everybody will, if you turn to Luke 22, we're going to talk about something this morning that uh, I believe we need to talk about. I'll tell you this story. Little Johnny was in class. Little Johnny always gets it, don't he? <laughs> Little Johnny, he's a mess. Little Johnny was in class. If he'd done everything you said he would do, he'd be 200 years old. He was in class with his teacher, and his teacher fell asleep. Little Johnny walked up to him and shook him and asked him, he said, Teacher, were you sleeping? And he said, the teacher said, No, I wasn't asleep. I was talking to God. So the next day, little Johnny fell asleep. And the teacher walked up to him and, and said, Hey, you sleeping in my class? And Johnny said, No, I was talking to God. So the angry teacher got upset and said, well, what did God say if you were talking to God? And Johnny said, well, God said, he never spoke to you yesterday. <laughs> Somebody lying. I don't know who's lying. One of them is, all right? So the last series that we, this is the last part of this series, the last one, is called Second Chances. And we talked about several things. We talked about how we got second chances from God. He's given us second chances just like Jesus did the thief on the cross. He gave him a second chance right at the end. You know, I've heard a lot of people say different things about, you know, uh, different things. Well, you know, well, people, this people, this person died where they saved, were they not saved? Uh, you know, well, we they, know they didn't live a life for Christ. I, I thought about this young man that Shane was talking about that, that we lost this last week and how Shane said he would come and pray at the altar. Every our altar service, he was off us up here praying. And uh, how good that was to know that. And so the other thing was is that a lot of people believed the thief on the cross died and went to hell. You know why? Because there wasn't very many people at the crucifixion. And all they remembered was the thief dying on the cross. But what they don't know was what the thief said to Jesus and what Jesus said to the thief. And he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And if you weren't at the crucifixion, you'd have walked up there and said, well, that poor thief went to hell. Not really, because he made it right with Jesus Christ. So we never know the situation that we're dealing with. So that's the hope that we have. But, so we talk about giving sinners, God gave sinners a second chance. He gave us all a second chance, just like a thief on the cross. The second one, we talked about Zacchaeus. We talked about how Zacchaeus was uh, given a second chance by Jesus, but the people around him, it was sinners. that We, we got to give sinners a second chance. There's times that we think sinners are just, it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth messing with them, but it is. We have to give them a second chance. We also have to give our families second chances. I didn't cover that one in the prodigal son. I started to go another one, but 
prodigal son, his brother came back, and when he came back, the, the older son was mad. And he told his dad, he said, your son's back, instead of saying my brother. And then the dad went out and tried to entreat the older son. He was mad. He said, you've never even given me a kid, but you kill a, a cow for him, let him eat, and he's all upset. And so we have to be able to give our family second chances. How many of you know giving family second chances is one of the toughest things you have to do? How many of you know that? Our families can be the worst that we deal with, the meanest, the hatefulest. The, I mean, they can be tough on us. The family can. And so that's part of it. We have to forgive them, and we have to let them have second chances. But today I want to talk about, uh, this week I want to talk about giving fellow believers a second chance. Now, this is one that you hit a whole new category because they say, well, they're supposed to be a Christian. And I was doing something the other day at the ball game, and I was giving them a hard time, and they said, you're supposed to be a preacher. They didn't say a Christian. They didn't say a church member. They didn't say a deacon. They didn't say a Sunday school teacher, but they put you at the highest level they can get you at. You're a preacher of all things, and so they really stick that in there on you because they want to make sure that you're held to the highest standard. So we look at different things like that, and so I was teasing them about something, and they were teasing me back about being a preacher or whatever. But the reason for this message for me today, I, I, God began to deal with me here a while back. I'd written a minister off a few years back, and there was something in his life that was not good, wasn't good. And I knew it. A lot of people didn't. I knew him personally, and uh, I saw the mistakes he made, and so I just kind of wrote him off. And, and uh, years later, God began to deal with me on that. And he said, you know, uh, this, this guy has basically is ministry began to flourish and and I saw things in his life that had changed and God spoke to me about you got to give this guy a second chance and today this guy's got a good work doing a good work for his character he had a hard time first time in his ministry because he was immature and he wasn't where he needed to be and so just because of that I wrote him off and God really dealt with me on that and that's why I'm preaching this message so I'm preaching to myself this morning okay so if you ain't I don't get none of this I'm just preaching to me so I can do that sometimes on the flip side of that, I had a minister call me not too long, it's been a few years back, maybe, I can't remember when it was, but anyway, he said, hey, I need to apologize to you, and I said, for what? And he said, well, when you started the church out there, and you started a non-denominational church, I believe that, you're, uh, that you didn't really know what you believed, and because of that, you were really not teaching right stuff, you were, false, you were a false teacher, and you were leading people down the wrong road, and he even said, the people even call your people Maxonites, and he said it made me mad because they actually contribute to your name to your people, and he said, I did not like that. I thought that was a, you know, a slap to God because people were following you instead of God, but he said, I've come to know and it's come to find out that after knowing you and getting to know you, he said, I realize now that, that you're not teaching false teaching. It's just that you don't have a name above the door that says only these people can show up. It doesn't have Pentecostal on the, on the door. It's just got New Life Church, so that means everybody's welcome. And he said, I didn't understand that. But I said, well, it's one of the hardest churches to pastor because you have different denominations that's come together that may believe something different than the other one. But the main thing we have to remember is we've got to be able to teach the whole truth for people to be able to leave out here and it affects every person, not just certain ones. And so him and I today are friends, and we're good friends, and we talk all the time. So it, it's completely made a difference there. So we ha he gave me a second chance, and I'm glad he did because I had no idea he felt that way, but he did. So, okay, so now, I'm, but I'm, I'll say this. I'm glad that I'm not the pastor I was 20 years ago. Uh, we have to have time to grow and room to grow, and so I'm glad that you let me mature and grow. I just hated that you had to go through the growing process with me because I hurt a lot of people in the process. And that's just not something I like to do, but I just had to live and learn it. And so Luke 22, let's start there in Luke 22, 54. This is where we're going to talk about Peter. Peter, they're crucifying Jesus, and they're fixing to take him and take him before Pilate. And so here's Peter in verse 54. And they've arrested Jesus, and they brought him to the high priest. But Peter followed, now notice this here, he followed at a distance. He was not close enough. He wasn't close to Jesus here. He was following at a distance. This is where a lot of people mess up in their, in their walk with Christ is because they are not following Jesus close enough and they're following at a distance and this is where mistakes are being made. Because when people aren't close to God, they'll make mistakes. And when you are close to God, you're going to make mistakes. But 
You, when you're following at a distance, it, you're not dedicated. They're, they're, we're not dedicated to that. We're not really, uh, the word's not really, our word may not be like it should be. We might tell you something and it may not be good. Uh, you know, a lot of times people, when they're following at a distance, they won't volunteer in the church for anything. They're here, but they're not here. I mean, they're here, but they're, they're not a lot of times that they're just, they want to be a part of something, but they don't want to get too close because it may cause them to have some kind of responsibility. And when we're following at a distance, uh, we're not close to him. And we'll make mistakes a lot of times that we would not make if we could hear his voice and we were right lined up with his voice. And so we may see it, and some, but, but some of them, you know, we may never give them a second chance. We may see that they're following him at a distance, and if they would just get closer to God, all this stuff would work out. And that's a true statement. The closer we get to God, the less we have problems, I think, with the things of the, the world. But we see this, so I'm just glad that uh, well, like I said a while ago, that I'm not the guy I was 20 years ago. Aren't you guys? See, at some point in time, we all weren't where we were now. We were someplace before, but as we've grown, we've grown in God, and we should be better at what we do and get a little wiser who we are. But now look what verse 55 says. He'd been following at a distance, and they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, and Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked at him, and she said, This man also is with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. That's the first. This is where the guys got all that. Woman. You know when guys say that to our wives? Woman. Peter started all that. We can give him credit for that. But after a little while, another one said to him, You're also of them. And Peter said, Man, I'm not. And about after an hour passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he's a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're saying. And immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Okay, if you go back and remember what Jesus told Peter, Peter said, I'll go with you till the end. I'll go with you till the end of all this. And Jesus told him, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Now look what happens in this next passage here. When he said, I don't know this, and the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. Now can you imagine standing there running with Jesus for three and a half years, and then all of a sudden you get in a tight spot and you deny him. Hey, we've all done that, haven't we? Well, I don't really know. I mean, let's just don't say nothing. We're believers, but let's just don't say nothing. Let's just stay out of it. We've all done that. Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Look what verse 62. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Okay, right here, most of us would have written Peter off. I can't even imagine what the other disciples were doing because Peter was the one who was their leader. He was older than the other ones. The other guys were probably teenagers. Peter was over 20. We talked about that in the temple tax here the other day. And so Peter's the oldest. He's the leader. And if the leader fails, man, everybody else is going to be scattered. That's what happened when, Je when they smote Jesus. He said the shepherd's going to be, they're going to smite the shepherd. The flock's going to be scattered. And that's what happened. But they're looking to Peter. And Peter said, I don't even know you. So could you love Peter? Would, would you love him? Say, hey. You, you threw Jesus under the bus. Well, do we love those people who are believers, and they're not there yet. They are not where they need to be. You know the army of the Lord is the only army that, 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 wound, that kill their wounded. I mean, we step on them, we plow them under, we just work over our wounded, and instead of trying to help somebody grow in the Lord, we're quickly to throw them under the bus and just say, don't nothing to do with them, forget it. And I thought about that minister that I was talking about. That's what I did to him. I would see him in town and I'd say hi, but I wouldn't really talk to him that much. I just thought his character, I just don't want to be around him. And the whole time, I'm I need to pull a plank out of my eye before I pull a splinter out of his. And I'm thinking, there's stuff in my life that I need to work on too. He don't see that, but I see the stuff he's done. But we're no different. We can't judge people on the fact that we think that we're just a little bit more spiritual than they are. That's no, I, we can't do that. We have to look at them. And, and if they're not where they need to be, that's where we're supposed to help them. What the Bible says... He says, man, you better take heed when you stand lest you fall. You may be the next one doing something wrong. Yeah. So we've got to be careful how we judge somebody. So what does is, what is long-suffering mean? If you look at Corinthians 13, I don't have it up there. We're not going to put it up there. But it talks about this. It says, and the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. It says, love suffers long. What does that mean? Well, when you look at it and it explains it, and I was looking at this, it means love has patience. And, and notice this. It waits and wishes for the reformation of a brother rather than resent his conduct. In other words, that's what having long suffering. I'm going to suffer along with this person because they're not where they need to be yet, but I'm not giving up on them. Jesus didn't give up on you and me. And he's put up with many flaws. We put up with neglects. 
from the person that it loves. And it it's, it's waits long to see the effects of the patience on them. In other words, we wait to see how God is going to mold them without just throwing them out, uh, the baby out with the bathwater. They say, just don't let, it, don't let them go. Just, you know, I hear a lot of people say this about the church. They'll say, well, the church is not doing this. The church is not doing that. Well, not everybody is that in, that, in that. You can't just lump everything together and throw it all out there together. It doesn't work that way. Because we are the church. When we say that, if you're a believer, you're the church, so you're talking about yourself. Well, the church aren't doing that. Well, are you a believer? Yeah, well, you're the church. So quit talking about yourself. You know, so they say, well, the church is not, the church needs to be doing, the church is out. Well, get in the middle of the church and be the church and show us how the church is supposed to live. Maybe we can follow you. That's the only thing I can tell you. Everybody's always got a solution. It's easy to ref on the sidelines. It's easy to pastor from back there. That ain't easy up here. It makes a little difference. It's, it's easier to preach or credit. You know, it's, it's just easier when it's back there. It's, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. But when you get up here, it's like everything's got to be right. So we had to be careful that love suffers long. So I'm glad you've suffered long with me as a pastor. I've made lots of mistakes in the past years, but you're still here. It's because you've suffered long. And not only that, it bears all things, it says in Corinthians there. But look what 1 Peter 4 and 8 says. When it says it bears all things, that means it covers everything. So when you see something wrong with someone, you cover it. Now here's the thing about the, the guy I was telling you about, the minister. I never went around town bad-mouthing it, and most people have no idea what his problem was. I guess. I never say anything. But I just, I just kind of shunned myself from him. But look what this passage of Scripture says. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. It will cover somebody's sins when we know something. Instead of telling everybody, we cover it and begin to pray for them. So we have long-suffering for them. We wait for the reformation for them, but we also cover them. We don't throw them under the bus. You know, charity does that. It, it hopes that we can make... Uh, it, it doesn't always expose people. It tries to help them to get through where they are. You know, I'm, there's a lady that I know uh, really well, and every time someone says something about something or negative, she'll say, yeah, but, but, but she always puts a positive spin on it, and I love to be around her because every time something comes up, she'll say, yeah, but you know what? They've had a hard time with that. Maybe they're growing in the Lord. Don't give up on them. And so every time someone says something, she's got a positive something to assert in there, and that's great. So let's see what happens here. We see Peter has denied Christ three times. Jesus has been crucified. Peter probably feels like a worm. He's out no telling where. And at one place he's out there said, I'm just going to go back to fishing. That's what I'm going to do. It's all I know. So I'm just going to quit the whole thing and go back to fishing. And the others say, well, we're going to go with you. And so later on, Jesus shows himself. But in the meantime, Peter's denied Christ three times. And I'm sure all these people are upset at Peter. Peter's probably out by himself. So look what happens on Resurrection Day in Mark chapter 16, verse 1. Turn to Mark 16 and 1. Check this out. Now this is where the women come to the tomb. They're going to find Jesus is gone. The tomb's empty. The stone's been rolled away. It's on the Sabbath. was passed. Mary Magdalene, the mother of James. Uh, Mary, the mother of James, and Sol uh, Salome brought spices and that might come to anoint him. Verse 2. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll the stone away from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Man, he's some great words. He's risen. He's not here. And see the place where they laid him. But now this is the whole thing behind this passage here. Go tell his disciples and check this out. He specifically says, and Peter. Well, why would he say that? Because Peter is the one who stood out there and said, I don't even know this cat. Y'all got me mixed up somebody else. And then he curses at one time. Says, woman, I don't know what you're talking about. Not only did he deny Christ, he's a liar. And if you lie, you fry. You know that. And here's Peter denying Jesus. And he don't know what to do. But he says, go tell his disciples. And make sure, above anything else, you tell Peter. Because right now, he's feeling worse than anybody else. We're going to give him a second chance. And he's going to go before you. So... What's he say? Here's the leader who's denied Jesus. He's probably ashamed, probably hiding. Maybe he, the others might have been mad at him. Only John was at the crucifixion. There was no other disciple there, just a bunch of women. 
That shows you how strong men are. They wasn't anybody but John there, and he was just a teenager. His mom probably told him he had to go. <laughs> you got to go. You're going. Get your clothes on. Let's go. Who knows? But I'm sure Peter thought he, you know, he should have been there. I wasn't even there at the crucifixion. So how can I? I'm not even a disciple. I went with him for three years, and I did. I cut the guy's ear off. He fixed it back, but I've denied him three times. So it's just miserable. Have you ever been in a situation where you're just miserable about something you've done? Just me? Man, I've, I've done things, and later on I'm going, man, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I had not have said that. Or I wish I hadn't have done that. Or I wish I had just stayed away from that. Or it wasn't any of my business, and I inserted my two cents, and I should have just kept my mouth shut. I didn't have no dog in the fight, and yet I inserted something I should have just left alone. Or we have sometimes we, we get upset uh, at road rage or something like that, and we say, we say something we shouldn't say. Now, I'm not, I'm not bad at cursing. I don't do that, but, it's, but I might say, idiots, get off the road. Well, the guy may be a born-again believer who's won thousands of souls to Jesus Christ, and I just call one of those people an idiot. We don't ever know what we're, we, you know. And so we have to be careful what we do because we feel bad at sometimes. So, so what does this do? Well, look what Jesus said right before, right before the crucifixion and the night before this. Jesus said, I'm going to give you a new commandment, and I want you to learn this commandment. This is what he says in John 13, 34. He said, a new commandment I give you. That you love one another, notice this, as I have loved you. And that you also, uh, that you also love one another. And he says in verse 35, by, all, by this all will know, notice this, that you're my disciples if you have love for one for another. Okay, so what we talk about love was, love was what? Long suffering. When you told somebody a while ago, I told you to tell them that you love them. You know what that means to you? That means you're committed to love them no matter how bad they are. No, that's not what that means. Yeah, it is. It's what Jesus said. He's loving Peter no matter how he denied him. He said, you've got to love people. You see, love's a commitment. It's not a feeling. So we commit to love one another. Even in our marriages, we say, I'm, I'm committed to love to you. Sometimes being married, sometimes, uh, sometimes we don't love one another. Amen. I mean, me and her do. We don't ever fight, you know. It's a, but <laughs> She fights real quiet. I say something and she don't say nothing. I say, what? If you're going to argue, talk. Speak something. Say something. She's real quiet, you know. She's like, just leave me alone, leave me alone. Uh, she don't fight like I do. I'm ready to, let's do something. Let's get this deal over, you know. So, But we, sometimes we don't feel like we love one another. You say, well, I don't feel love right at that point. When you're arguing with your spouse or you're arguing with your friend or if you're arguing with your brother or sister or your family member, you may not feel love, but that's not what love is. It's not a feeling. It's a commitment, and people get that mixed up. We're committed to love because we committed, we said we would love, so we did. And so Jesus said, this new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I've loved you. Now, he probably, Peter was feeling terrible, but he, he wasn't committed to Jesus because he was afraid, so he tells him he don't know anything about him. But he suffered long. And you see, but he waited for Peter to grow. And at the end, when he res resurrected, if you remember, he's in the room with him, and he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. And he asked him a second time, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yeah, Lord, I love you. And he said, then feed my sheep. And the third time, Jesus says, do you love me? And by this time, the Bible says Peter gets aggravated and says, Lord, you know I love you. I just made a mistake here a while back, and I, I denied you, but you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. And most theologians say the reason that he, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me, is because he denied him three times. He made up for that. So he told Jesus, he said, I don't, know, I don't know who he is three times, but Jesus says, do you love me? He said, I love you three times. I don't think that's coincidence. I think God was trying to reinstate him and say, Peter, I love you too. You're going to have to help me though. You need to feed my sheep because I'm leaving this with you. You're going to have to guide these young men. So this is what I want you to do. And later on, we see at the gate beautiful in Acts 3, Peter and John's walking up to the gate beautiful and they look at this guy who's lame and he says, hey, I, I need some money. He goes, I ain't got no money, but what I got, I give to you. And he grabbed me by the hand and raised him up. Amen. You see, Peter took the torch that had been passed to him and began to do what God called him to do. Jesus called him to do it, so he did it. And you say, well, that's great that Jesus did that, but that doesn't, I mean, how do we do it? That was Jesus. Well, let me show you another scripture in the Bible that shows about another believer who wasn't what they thought he should have been either. Turn to Acts 15, 36. Check this out. After some days, Acts 15, 36, Paul and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back now and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of God and see how they're doing. 
Paul and Barnabas began to establish all these churches. They'd get them established. They'd put elders. They'd try to get a presbyter or a pastor over them. And then they would go start another church. That's why he was an apostle. He was a church starter. That's why he was called Paul the Apostle. That's what that actually means. He starts churches. He, he births churches. And so they'd put these churches all out there. And he tells Barnabas, let's go back and let's check on these people. And Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark. Okay, so he says, I want to take Mark with us. And so Paul insisted they should not take him. Uh, he'd been the one who departed from them from Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. In other words, Mark had started on a missionary journey with them. And in the middle of this journey, he, he quit. And he gave up and he went back. And so Paul said, I don't want to take this cat with me again. He, he's already quit us once. He's a quitter. I'm not taking him. Barnabas is actually... Theologians say he was actually his nephew or his cousin. They think more it was his nephew than his cousin. Depends on what commentary you're reading or what guy's talking about it. But he's kin to Barnabas. And Barnabas wants to take Mark because he sees something in Mark that he knows there, but he knows he's not good yet. He's not where he needs to be. But Barnabas wants to take him and help train him. And Paul says, forget it. I ain't doing it. I ain't messing with him no more. I ain't going. And the Bible says the contention here in the next verse was so sharp between them that they parted ways. And so Barnabas took Mark with him, and Paul took, uh, Paul took uh, Silas. Couldn't remember his name. Paul takes Silas. So they part and go away. Now, here's the thing you've got to remember. Even in ministry, there are people who are going to be to a disagree with certain things. But that's okay because works happen in different areas. That's why there's different churches and different things that go on. So there's different areas that we can work in. Doesn't mean that Paul and Barnabas hated one another. They just disagreed and Paul said, I don't want to use him. Paul said, well, Barnabas said, I'll take him and I'll train him and I'll take him with me. So they part ways and go do their own thing. Now, Mark, the one who left the missionary journey, when they disagree, everybody believes that Mark is the same Mark that wrote Mark that's in the Bible. He was the young disciple and they were trying to get him trained. So he's the one that we believe wrote Mark in the New Testament. And so, okay, so they groomed him to help him. He's needing some missions work done. But now look what happens then later on in 2 Timothy 4 and 9. Okay, 2 Timothy 4 and 9. Here's Paul writing to Timothy, and this is what he says to Timothy. He says, listen here, be diligent and come to me quickly. Paul was needing some help in the missions work because he was needing, he needed help. He, he was running low on people to help him, kind of like we do here sometimes, we run low on volunteers. He says, Demas has forsaken me. Notice this. Having loved this present world, he's departed for Thessalonica. Thess Thessalonica. I'll get right in there. He says he left because he wanted to go back and do what he wanted to do. He quit me. So, but he says here, and, and so he talks about these guys that's left him. Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. And he said, no, this is verse 11. He said, only Luke is with me. Now Luke the physician, the one that wrote Luke, he said, only Luke is with me. Now notice what he says in the next verse. He says, go get Mark. Oh, I didn't think you liked Mark. Well, I didn't before, but now he's grown, he's matured, and I can use him now. So Paul didn't sit and kick him out and say, no, he left us three years ago, so he's worthless, we can't use him again. He looks at him and he says, bring Mark with me. Notice what he says in the next, this last passage, this passage of Scripture. He is useful to me in ministry. In other words, I can use him now because he is elevated. He's matured to a place that I can now use him. So we cannot write people off just because they've made mistakes young, whether it be in their ministry, whether it be in their Christian life. It doesn't matter what it is. We cannot write people off. That's not what we do. You have to be able to allow them to grow and, and, and make it in what they're doing. I thought about some of you guys who've uh, been incarcerated. I talk about Brother Chris a lot because he, he's real open about it, does our jail ministry, him and T.H. Buckner. And they'll tell those guys, I've been where you've been. And, but God didn't give up on us because at some point in time, Jesus came into Chris's life, Brother T.H.'s life, and changed them. They're not the guys they were years ago because God has changed something in them. And now I trust him with jail ministry because I believe he's got a great heart and knew what he needs to be doing. You see, the change came not because he was in jail, but because he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And Jesus molded it into what it needed to be. We can't mold ourselves sometimes, but Jesus molds us into what we need to be. Amen. So we got to be able to be pliable. But then on the other hand, all of us who are way up here and see all those people who are way down here, we got to be pliable too. 
We can't turn our nose up and say, well, when they get up here with me, I'll have something to do with them. We help them. Say, hey, listen, you can't do that. This, it doesn't look good. You have to do this. You've got to do something else. And we try to help them. That's what we do. We help them to get where they need to be because apparently Barnabas saw something in Mark that he liked. And he knew that Mark had something in him. And if I could ever just get him and get him with me long enough, I can train him and get him where I need to be. And he will be totally different. And Paul saw it. And at a point in time, he says, hey, I need some help. Bring Mark. He's useful for me in ministry. What was he saying? I've seen a change in this guy. He's grown. This is where he's going. That's what he's doing. So when we see young people, uh, we see young people, we see older people, we see people uh, middle-aged, we see people as Sunday school teachers that may not, uh, maybe not do exactly what think we think they need to do it. We've got to have long-suffering. We've got to cover some of the deals and help them to be what they need to be. How many times have we written off people that have been mature in their characters, not, you know, it's not there yet. We write them off too soon and say, well, written them off too soon. I remember as a young kid playing basketball at Greasy, and I was real small. I weighed, I weighed, I weighed 87 pounds in the eighth grade. I said, Pastor, what happened? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I kind of ballooned. <laughs> uh, 89 pounds. I made the 90 pound tournament. Now that'd be now that'd be bad. I mean, you couldn't do 90 pounds. Oh, you can't do that. You know, because they're overweight. <laughs> they might have a complex. If you're over 90, you can't play. It's that simple. But I remember being so small that it's like they wrote me off and said, you know, he's just too small. He's not. He's you know he can't play. He wants to play basketball. He's too little. And and so this went on through high school. I wasn't as probably. I was probably about five foot eight then. I think I grew more after I got out of high school when I played independent ball than I was this size, but I was about 30 pounds lighter. <laughs> but I remember playing those guys that I played in grade school. And, and I remember how different it was because instead of being intimidated by them, I, I, I intimidated them because I talked trash to them all the time. And that wasn't a thing to do, but that's just what I did because I remembered all the times they wrote me off. And I remember picking teams and I will be the last one picked. Y'all ever been the last one picked in teams? Now, maybe y'all haven't been that way, but this little 89-pound kid was. Uh, y'all can have him. He's not no good. Just throw him out there in the field somewhere. Y'all know what I'm talking about? No, we, don't never, we ain't never done that. But I remember being standing there being the last one picked, and they were looking at me and say, and they would say, y'all can have him. It's not going to make a difference either way. I don't care if we got 10 and y'all got three, y'all can have, you know, take the 11 and have and so that done something in my mind that thought, and I, just, I began to think, you know what, at some point in time, this is going to change. And I remember playing independent ball against those guys, and I remember, I didn't do everybody that way, but there was two or three that were smarter, and I just rubbed it in their face. And every time I'd score, I'd let them know all the way down the court. You ain't going to stop me. I'm going to score all night long. You can't stop me. Nothing you can do about it. They'd say, shut up. And I'd say, I ain't shutting up. I was a nobody in eighth grade. Now look at you. You're a nobody in independent ball. We're all grown up now and you're a nobody. You say, Pastor, you talked to them that way? Yes, yeah, certain ones I did because they deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to remember I wasn't saved either, okay? so. But I remember later on thinking, you know, later on after I got saved, now I'm, I, I've talked to those guys and they were good. I, I mean, I've... I, we, I told them, I said, hey, I might have been a jerk playing ball. They said, no, nah, that's just competition. That's just the way it is. But I'm not that way to them now. But I said that to say this. You've got to give people time to grow. Because at some point in time, even when people bully kids, sometime that little kid's going to grow up. And the bully may be this tall and the kid may be this tall. And it will come back around to you. So we've got to give people time to grow. And spiritually saying the same thing. I want to close with this. You guys can come on. I want to close with this this morning. There was a story told, a sad story really, but it's a, it's a true story here, uh, of a young preacher who had a lot of problems and he failed in many areas. He wasn't very good. His character was kind of bad. He had not been molded yet. And there was a young man's father who criticized the young preacher constantly. He gave, him a bad, he gave a bad name to his son. He would always say, talk negative about this preacher to his son. And then years later, the young preacher, as he got older, became mature, improved in his character. But by the time this happened, the young man who became bitter 
against God and against preachers. He refused to live for God. He just didn't want anything to do with God. And one day the son who'd grown up to be, you know, grown up, but he'd become deathly ill with a terminal illness. And the young preacher who had also aged in years, the father who had been, who had seen this preacher, he, he became a godly man who had changed his life and his mind about him and everything. So he began to believe this preacher had changed and now he was doing good and he was doing a good work. And so he talked to the guy and he said, would you come pray for my son? And, and the man said, yeah, I'll come pray for your son. And so the preacher came and walked into the room. And when he walked into the room, the son said to his father, why have you called this man? This is the man that you said is a hypocrite and don't have good character. Why are you calling him in here now to pray for me? And his dad said, well, son, I was wrong. He said, yeah, you were wrong. But he said, I, I, it's still in my mind. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want him praying for me. And so the kid wouldn't let him pray. And... Uh, the boy died. And to the knowledge of them, he never accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And the man told the preacher, he said, I've made a huge, a grave mistake. When you were young, your character wasn't like I thought it to be. And he said, I, I noted that to my child, that you weren't what everybody thought you were. But he said, as time goes on, I've seen God's change and mold you. But it was too late for my son. And he said, he died without God. And he said, I just want to apologize. But it was too late. You see, the things that we do sometimes when so we cut people off and just give them up and give them out and say it's over, they'll never amount to a whole lot, it affects people around us. It affects that person. And I remember, you know, talking to different people about their relationship and seeing them. And when we see people that need help, we need to pray for them, have long suffering and cover their sins and say, let me help you with that. If we can help them, help them. That's our job is to help. If the Bible says, it talks about the older men and the older women, how they're supposed to teach the younger women. If you go over there in Titus and look at that, it says, the older women, you're supposed to teach the younger women. It talks exactly what it says is how to keep home, how to keep the home, how to love their children, and how to love their husbands. And how do you're taught? You're taught by older women. So how many of you older women see younger women that not maybe not doing it like you think they should because they're young? Well, help them. Help them. Say, hey, I'll help you. Be glad to help you. Anyway. And show them how it should be done versus just criticizing how they should be done. Also in Titus, it talks about the older men teaching the younger men how to live, how to be sober, how to, how to treat their families. It, we're supposed to teach them. That's one thing about the Jews that I love about their uh, society there and their culture at 12 years old they take a young boy and they start teaching them how to be a man we need to do that here but we don't but we do I mean well, they do that and so at 12 years old they're learning how to be a man how to act how to work how to do all those kind of things they teach them and they grow up more successful so our job when we see believers who are not like we think they should be instead of going ahead and pushing them to the side is get them to the side if we have to and say we can I'll help you let me help you that's our job that's what Jesus did for Peter. He said, go tell the disciples and make sure you tell Peter. Make sure you tell Peter that I'm alive. I want you to bow your head this morning.